Lily and her rangers, including the mayor, his wife, and Ace, prepare to leave Quartz. With some extra hands, she decides to return to the mine. First, Lily radios in. No promotion. At the mine, hideous mutants howling and screeching attack. One blind mine crawler at 40 feet. Rosie drills it with the 45 slug. We find the half-eaten remains of what might have been a human. Gear is scattered all around the area. The half-eaten corpse had a canteen. Sure didn't save him. Wait, something about this next section, a tunnel doesn't look right. Varla's adjusting her glasses. The passageway is trapped. We have to move through it very carefully. Too late. Deadfall. The ceiling is crashing and thundering down all around us. Now the passageway is completely blocked with rubble. It would take explosives to get through. Hideous mutants howling and screeching attack us. Again. One shaft slider at 30 feet. Billy introduces it to her sledge. We find the half-eaten remains of what might have been another human. Again, gear is scattered all around. Hideous mutants howling and screeching attack us yet again. One shadow claw at 20 feet. This thing is so tough. It seriously injures Varla and knocks Ace and the mayor's wife out before Lily could kill it with an explosive charge. Rosie snickers as Lily has to play doctor. Lily radios in. No promotion. Just when we thought we'd seen everything. One naked mole rat at 41 feet. The wishes it had cover from Rosie's Cult 45. Some pre-Holocaust miner had made a tunnel into the living rock of the mountain. Now the smell tells us that it's home for many desert creatures. Warning, muties are attacking. One dark viper at 10 feet. Rosie's got it again. More half-eaten remains and gear. Some rope. Mutant beasties don't like to be disturbed. Two tunnel lizards at 22 feet. Farla hooks the last with a crowbar. Yep, more half-eaten remains and gear. A bulletproof shirt for the mayor. A curious spot. There's a lot of rubble on the floor as if someone's been chipping at the walls recently. The rocks look strange. Lily tries to recall her metallurgy training. There's a vein of silver here. Lily imagines Billy chipping out a fortune. Billy warms up and chips out quite a bit of silver. Two dollars worth. She works up a sweat. Seven dollars worth. She's drenched. Three dollars worth. Okay, enough of that. Warning. Muties are attacking. One undergrounder at ten feet. Bobby? Farla's adjusting her glasses. The mayor's wife ain't afraid and does them in with a nine millimeter. Warning. Muties are attacking. Again. Two geckos at 14 feet. Ace stomps on the last one, but not before the mayor and his wife pass out. Having found nothing unusual in the mines, Lily decides to return to the Desert Nomad camp to deliver the Head Crusher's response to the Atchison's tent. And this time, we have a case of snake squeezins for the Hobo Oracle. Billy throws him a bottle. The hastily inhaled snake squeezins dull the hobo's eyes and deepen his voice. He tells us, a body is only a box to keep your mind in. Lily nods to Billy, and Billy throws him another bottle. The hobo quickly drains the bottle of snake squeezins and drops into a trance. Then, uttering each word metronomically, he says, A steel storm threatens the city of gold. Another bottle. Snake squeezins drip off the hobo's chin as he drains the bottle. His eyes grow distant and his voice drops an octave. To the mother who speaks in riddles comes a child of promise. Aid her and aid justice. Yet another bottle. The hobo finishes the snake squeezins in record time and smiles wisely at us. He burps, One man's dream is another's nightmare, but a machine's dream is everyone's nightmare. And another bottle still. The hobo nods to us and then drains the bottle of snake squeezins. Twins born by the same hands, he intones solemnly, are twins no more. Wake the sleeper to cure the sick. Rosie gasps. Billy shakes her head as if to ensure it's okay. One more bottle. The hobo lowers the now empty bottle of snake squeezins and stares at us with glassy eyes. Destroy the wounds and destroy the threat. He then passes out. Wow, that hobo can drink. 
As mentioned before, this may sound like a lot of nonsense, but what's neat is I think they all actually foretell events that may happen during the course of the game. So it'd be neat to look back at these in hindsight. So we have a message, Caterpillar, from the head crusher in quartz for the Atchison's tent. But we don't know which tent that is. Varla adjusts her glasses and recommends we approach each tent in turn from east to west. We approach the first tent and Lily gives the message. The guard looks at her quizzically, scratches his head, and then disappears into the tent. An excited discussion ensues. The guard emerges again, looking somewhat enlightened. This must not be the Atchison's tent. Lily stares at Varla, adjusting her glasses. We approach the second tent, and Lily gives the message. The guard looks at her sharply and then indicates we should enter the tent. Lily smiles at Varla. We find ourselves in a splendidly furnished tent. Men, women, children, and elders alike smile and greet us. From behind, we hear the guard say, Welcome to the Topeka clan, fools. At this, the entire clan brandishes hidden weapons and attacks en masse. I am a Topekan. Five Topekan men at 20 feet. I am a Topekan. Six Topekan women at 20 feet. Apparently, the children are Topekan too. Four Topekan children at 20 feet. I am a Topekan. Five Topekan elders at 28 feet. Horny buzzing as Billy takes out all the men with full auto 600 round per minute Uzi fire. Billy chucks a grenade. And then one last combatant joins the fray. A pistol packing baby Topekan. One baby Topekan at 30 feet. No amount of baby fat is going to save this pistol packing baby as Rosie fires the 45, reducing him to a thin red paste. Now it's official. Lily hates nomads. Oh look, another broken toaster. We approach the third and last tent, and Lily gives the message. The guard looks Lily over closely and then tells her to wait outside as he disappears into the tent. She hears a brief muffled conversation and the guard returns with another man. The newcomer introduces himself as the headman of the Atchison clan. He understands that she has done a great favor for his brother. He dismisses the guard and motions her closer. He explains that they keep no treasure here, but he will give her directions to a secret cache. Here, take this shovel, he instructs her. Stand on the south rail, west end. Take 12 paces to the south, dig, and you shall be rewarded. The guard returns and the headman bids her a good day. Buried treasure. It's worth a look. We do as the Anderson headman instructed. From the west end of the rail, we take 12 paces south. Lily directs Billy to dig. Billy's shovel hits a crate. Inside, $181 in grenades. But we've been followed. It's an ambush. Rail thieves burst out of hiding, wielding deadly steel pry bars. What are you looking at? Three rail thieves at 14 feet. Lily nails the last one in the back with an M19 as they try to run away. Everyone, including the mayor, his wife, and Ace, are ready to head to Vegas. But first, Lily radios in. No promotion. North of Quartz, we see a broken down Jeep. Ace fixes the Jeep, and Rosie dubs it Ranger One. We're on our way. After a long journey, the Jeep sputters and wheezes and finally stops, lucky for us, in a gas station in the settlement of Needles. This former gas station is now really only a garage. So the Jeep is broken and needs to be fixed. Apparently, Ace can't do it this time. Lily wakes the attendant. I see your Jeep is busted. Want me to fix it? She's curious how much it'll cost. After checking the Jeep briefly, he tells her that it needs a new engine. But engines are scarce these days. I'll hold the Jeep for you till you want it fixed. Let's check out Needles. We face some angry foes. One jerk at 14 feet. The mayor knows how to deal with jerks, now with a 9mm. Old and cracked concrete walls and an old, tall, rusting railing surround the town waste pit. Needles has a train? The train engineer yells, All aboard! Getting on? Not that these guys are. Two sand bombs at 14 feet. The mayor does it again. We take a train ride. The twins love it. But it doesn't go very far. I'm always here to give you a ride. Just ask for old Ed the engineer. Farla examines the rails, adjusts her glasses, and remarks that the railroad looks newly made, but the rails look very old. Downtown Needles. 
We see a woman that looks like a soldier. Who's well, curious if she's for hire? The roster. You can create up to four characters when you start the game and can have up to seven party members. That's why Lily's about to tell the mayor to return to his constituents and courts. The mayor kisses his wife goodbye and leaves for courts. The woman that looks like a soldier? She spits on the ground but joins us. Billy likes her. Meet Christina. She likes fully automatic and comes fully prepared with a rad suit and an Uzi SMG Mark 27. Lily's impressed enough to make her an honorary desert ranger. We come up to what looks like a private club. An eyeball appears in a hole in the wall and asks, what's the password? Billy blurts out, ugly. Rosie chuckles, blow off. This tour bus is gutted by explosions. Absolutely nothing of value here. Leroy's place, a boutique. Leroy's was a classy clothing store, but now paint peels on the walls. Times have changed too. There's a big ammo counter in the back. A rack of old torn up suits and tuxedos. Racks of faded dresses and skirts. Striped clothing for waist metal concerts. Camouflage clothing for the fashion conscious desert dweller. The bar on the west wall is selling $10 drinks. Lily stops at the arms counter. Leroy's has flamethrowers too. Christina wants a drink. Bartender takes her money and gives her a glass of bitter piss water. After a few sips, he tells her about a weird cult, the Servants of the Mushroom Cloud, and tells her to watch out for their blood staff. Blood staff? Is that like an infection? Across the street from Leroy's. Impassable rubble. This used to be a two-story building, but the top story collapsed. A sexy, three-legged lady leans against the wall. Interested, cutie? Fifty dollars. Billy makes an obscene gesture with her fingers and tongue. Too bad, sailor. You might have had a good time. Who's she calling sailor? The three-legged muty cutie is standing outside a normal house, but a handmade sign over the door says, Rosie's Motel. Members only. Mounds of concrete blocks and junk block the alley. Varla stumbles into a crater in the road caused by mortar fire. This abandoned art gallery is now a shelter for these homeless people who don't want to become hobo dogs. A completely wrecked truck. Rosie peeks to see if it has an engine. This Hollywood style shop used to sell movie stills, posters, press kits, and scripts, but all the stuff has been ripped. All that remains are some posters sealed to the wall behind plastic. One poster says, Gone with the Nuke Storm. Another reads, You've played the game, now experience the movie. Crater Raider. On the bulletin board in the back, Coming soon, the Radheads. A sign says, Mutants not allowed. Rosie chuckles and points at her sister. Crowley's Occult Shop. There's a clerk with a foot-long beard sleeping in a corner. Shelves hold various mystical items. Lily has no luck trying to wake up the proprietor. He's been asleep for weeks, it seems. There's a shelf with a crystal ball on it. Lily looks into the crystal ball and she sees... She sees... She sees an angry wizard on a mountain screaming, What do you think this is? Bard's tail? Just in case you don't know, Interplay, the developers of Wasteland, also developed Bard's tail in 1985. Spellbooks. No, spells won't work, Lily. Instruction books for fortune telling, palm reading, and dowsing. Some prime quality dowsing rods. A shelf with tarot cards, incense sticks, and holders. Behind the stores is a large wooden platform with lots of tables and chairs for customers of restaurants in the area. As we enter, an accordion player rushes over and starts playing Intruder. He doesn't want money, just practice. Rosie, don't walk on the tables. This used to be a nice place. A vendor has bottles on a band of lazier around his chest. Want some snake squeezins? Best around for 15 bucks. Lily ignores him. A former sports car destroyed by howitzer fire. Rosie peeks under the hood. A fast food stand. A girl behind the counter says, Welcome to Hobo Dogs. Items are $5 each. Would you like to order? Orla adjusts her glasses and reads the menu. Hobo Dogs. French fried fingers. Barbecued brains. Scalps over easy, tramps rump, rosy snickers, blood sausage. Lily never thought she'd miss Cookie's chuck wagon back in courts. 
Across the street from Hobo Dogs, two guys guard a doorway. Billy finds a working howitzer in the park. She's frowning because there doesn't appear to be any shells around. What's left of the wall by the howitzer is part of a building that appears to be totally shattered by explosions. Everybody, including the mayor's wife and Ace, venture north of the garage. Some heavy fighting has happened here. The town wall has been blown away. We face some angry foes. One lost soul at 10 feet. The mayor's wife helps him find his way with a 9mm. The ammo bunker. It's cool and dark inside. A heavy musty smell fills the air. Puddles of blood splash when Billy steps in them. It's obvious that no one comes here very often. The M3 Regan all-terrain hover tank that used to be here left a long time ago to fight against the invaders. Billy wonders how Varlin knew that. This used to be a very powerful artillery piece. Too bad it's broken in several places. A rusted pile of wires and armor plating are all that remain of an M3 rat. Careful, Varla. Might get cut by the metal pieces. We find a body. Billy sees an incision in his neck and finds a ruby ring and a blood staff on him. Billy puts the ring on his sister's finger. <laughs> it goes well with her freckles. Varla reminds us that somebody warned us about the blood staff. These shelves have some mean looking grenades and some ugly gray lumps of plastic explosives. Billy's excited. She found a howitzer shell. Hold it. This stuff looks booby trap. Maybe that's why it's still here. Varla? Whoops. She bumped it while adjusting her glasses. Now we're... Boom! Everybody's knocked back by the blast. What a mess. The shells were destroyed in the explosion. Pieces of bloody robes are scattered about. Burned and blackened metal lies all around. There are several old ammo clips and even an old power pack on the shelves along with old bloody robes. On the shelves are several packs of TNT. This stuff is so old it'll blow up if we stand too close. Lily? Whoops, she bumped it, trying to recall her demolitions training. Now we're... Boom! Everybody's knocked back by the blast. What a mess. Again. We walk out of the old ammo dump into the fresh dry air of needles. We go into the police station through the swinging doors. Opposite the entrance are one-way cell doors which Varla doesn't believe could be opened from this side. A wimpy robot clerk sits behind a desk, swamped with paperwork. Yeah, it demands irately. Lily has an idea. Maybe she can swindle a rad suit out of the police. She claims she wants to report a crime. The wimpy clerk takes out a little black book. You want to report a theft? What was stolen? She claims her rad suit was stolen. All right, who did it? She claims a jerk did it. The robot clerk writes something in his notebook and puts it away. Don't get your hopes up. We have to deal with the bloodstab murders first. Lily frowns. She hasn't heard of these murders. The robot clerk squints at her. You mean you're not here about the murders? People are found dead, drained of blood. I think it's some mutant vampire or something from the desert. He looks at Lily very hard. How do I know you're really rangers? Just you keep your noses clean in my town, here. Well, it was worth a shot. We have a blood staff. Maybe that's a bad thing. Lily radios in. No promotion. At the desk, Lily notices we're being watched by a robot cop. When Billy gets too close, he jumps up, pistol ready. Lily asks the robot clerk for neighborhood watch tips, chucks a neighborhood watch pamphlet at us, and goes straight back to its work. The pamphlet contains two tips for the wise. One, buy an AK-97 assault rifle. Two, if there's someone hanging around your neighborhood you don't know, shoot them. Lily asks to see the detective. The wimpy clerk checks a notebook and says, You're lucky. He's free right now. Follow the hallway. It's the first door on the left. Well, go on. We make our way down the hall to the detective's office. Varla notices an alarm bell on the wall. A sign on the door says, Spam Shade Detective. As we go in, Spam Shade looks up at us from behind a sheet of explosive glass that stretches from ceiling to floor. This detective reminds Lily of Humphrey Bogart. As she approaches, he snicks a match with his thumbnail and lights a cigarette. An overflowing ashtray sits on his desk besides an open bottle of scotch. His eyes are cold and hard as he watches her. She notes the lump of a Roscoe in her shoulder holster under his gray suit coat. He introduces himself as Spam Shade and points out 
But I'll not play the sap for her or anybody else. That's settled. He asks what she wants. He notices the ruby ring on Rosie's finger. Where'd you get that thing? The detective demands. I think His Holiness is looking for that thing. Then, going back to his work, Sam says, I suppose you want to know about the blood staff. Wipes his hand on a greasy rag and sighs. Don't mind telling you the murders have lots of folks worried. People just up and vanish. Then, when we find them again, they've been drained of blood. Every drop. Rosie gasps. He squints at Rosie, and his voice drops to a tense whisper. I seen one of the bodies, and it had a cut in the neck, just like a scar my grandmother had on her neck. She said once when she was little, a priest used the bloodstaff on her after she got snake bit. I think the bloodstaff is involved, and that means trouble. What? Alright, maybe we should speak with His Holiness. But first we visit the New Thoughts Library. Quiet, please. You are in a center of higher learning. Here you can finally see how skill points SKP are spent. The first rank of a skill costs one point, the second costs twice that, the third twice that, and so on. The higher a character's intelligence, IQ, the more skills available to them. Not every library offers the same set of skills. Billy finds a book on probability, and Lily finds a book on electronics she's never seen before. There's also a book on toaster repair that Lily would like Marla to read, but it's not in English. Ace reads up on the Heckler and Koch line of firearms. Old Doc Bobs. At least there's a doctor in town, I guess. What's left of the city's defensive wall looks old and broken. Dummies. Everyone should be smart enough not to touch cactus. Back downtown in the park with a howitzer, Lily at least lets Billy load a shell. It slides into place with a click. Viable targets include west, southwest, or south. Lily makes Varla write that down in case we need to blow something up later. Lily decides to investigate the town waste pit after all. Dried blood covers the floor. We see torn shreds of bloodstained clothes lying all over the place. The room looks as if many sacrificial murders have taken place here. What's left of the door is a hundred little burned pieces of metal. At the end of the hole are two doors. Billy goes to the one on the right. There isn't enough metal left on this door to make a paperclip. She opens it in a way that will never let it be closed again. Now Billy goes to the one on the left. This steel door looks very thick and heavy. Lily has to blow it with TNT. The shattered remains littering the floor. Another door? More TNT. Inside? Somebody went through this room and wrecked it so long ago that everything is rusted. Everything except the locks, right? We go down the other hallway. It's a steel door as new as the day it was put in. Billy puts her shoulder into it. She also puts her shoulder into a side storage room door, revealing another room that looks as if it has been used for sacrificial murders. As we walk down the stairs, our steps echo hollowly. Two more very thick and heavy steel doors, both requiring TNT. Lily sees some old skeletons lying in the corner. How did she miss it? A hideous, 20-foot-tall beast, a mix of pig and crocodile, turns to attack us. One pit ghoul at 36 feet. It's an epic struggle. The twins fall mortally wounded, Varla seriously wounded, and everyone else but Lily critically wounded. The last thing Lily sees is a pit ghoul bearing down on her here in the town waste pit. Your life has ended in the wasteland. Sound familiar? Okay, round two. One pit ghoul at 36 feet. Lily gets her ghoul in the end, chucking an explosive charge at it and killing it. Pace was knocked out during the battle. Varla reads something hot in the middle of the room, and it's not Lily. Lily wants the rad suit to investigate, so trades clothes with the Christina. Rosie snickers again at her heart print underwear. A broken radioactive waste container is lying in the middle of the room, buried in the trash. I mentioned the radioactivity meter early on, but here's a clear example of how it functions. It's actually in the red as Lily occupies the same space as the container. If she didn't have the rad suit, she'd be radiated and we'd have to visit old Doc Bobs. On the way back from the container, Lily's ambushed. These hungry looking wild animals think she's lunch. Five desert tubes at 14 feet. Christina burns a clip and stitches them full of bullets. 
another door, another stick of dynamite. A room of high-tech equipment that's been destroyed by explosives. All that remains is a sign on the wall. Yet another door, yet another stick of dynamite. An M1989 A1 NATO assault rifle for Varla and two rad suits. One for Varla and one for Billy. Not a bad haul for the town waste pit. Okay, let's talk to His Holiness at the Servants of the Mushroom Cloud Church. The Mushroom Bishop explains to Lily, I sent out my second in command to look into a series of murders. She notices the Bishop nervously twisting a ruby ring around his finger. She nods to Rosie to show His Holiness her ruby ring. Rosie, stay off the altar. Where did you find that? Oh my god, he must be dead. The blood staff was stolen from here and I'll generously reward you if you find it and bring it back. Last I knew, he was going back to downtown Needles. Blood staff? Lily gives the bishop the blood staff we found at the ammo bunker. What are you trying to pull? This isn't the real blood staff. It breaks it over Rosie's head and throws us out. So we have to find the real blood staff. Could it be at the Temple of Blood? We enter the Temple of Blood. We don't want no temple desecrators here. Two guards at 14 feet. Varla stitches them full of bullets with her new NATO assault. Varla adjusts her glasses and studies the walls. They appear to be flowing rivers of blood, but a glass wall actually holds the blood back. Bloodstained door is locked. Dried blood covers the handle. We find the entrance to the sacrifice room. A sign says, Do not enter. Electric torture room. Hey, you guys don't belong here. Two guards at 10 feet. Ace, Ace is the last with his 45. The glowing torchlight flickers across a horrific scene. Men in torn and blood spattered robes struggle against the ropes binding them to massive steel tables. The tables slope down at the head and a catch basin at the lowest corner is used to collect the dark flow of blood dripping from the small wounds cut into each writhing victim. Priests rush from one table to another, gathering buckets the way a dairy farmer gathers the bucket of milk from his cows. They pour the smaller quantities of blood into a hole in the floor, but Lily can't tell where the dark fluid drains away to in this dim chamber of horrors. Lily wishes she could just point the howitzer in the park downtown at this temple and then just <laughs> sift through the rubble for the staff. Now we shall execute you. Two executioners at 22 feet. Rosie executes the last executioner with a favorite firearm. One of them has a blood staff. There's a man here, dressed in rags. He's held captive by an ever-lowering laser beam. Of course, we all get zapped by the powerful laser beam. Orla adjusts her glasses and deactivates the laser at the control board. Thank you for rescuing me, says the hobo. I guess if Hobo Dogs doesn't get you, the Temple of Blood will. We return to His Holiness at the Servants of the Mushroom Cloud Church. So you have returned. Where is the Blood Staff? Lily gives him the Blood Staff found on the Executioner at the Temple of Blood. What are you trying to pull? This isn't the real Blood Staff. He breaks it over Rosie's head and throws us out. Again. Back to the Temple of Blood. Hey, you guys don't belong here. One hunter at 30 feet. A robot? Christina's Uzi spits lead and stitches it full of bullets. Hey, you guys don't belong here. Four silicon snipers at 14 feet. These robots are relentless. Varla empties a clip on them, but not before the mayor's wife and Ace fall unconscious. Lily radios in. She's promoted to senior specialist. A door opens into a huge altar room. Everyone inside is in deep meditation and ignores us. Lily sits for a moment. Lily sees written on the chair, the launch code is Modicum. We quietly sneak through the altar room and go down a passageway before two double doors or locker rooms on either side. To the right, a Kevlar vest for Rosie. To the left, bulletproof shirts that nobody needs. Billy kicks open the double doors. A pair of blood guardians flank a complex control panel the like of which Billy's not seen before in the wasteland. One of the guards looks at us and she hears him mutter infidels under his breath. Beyond them she sees a large area of painted floor that looks very much like a giant chessboard 
but she can't begin to guess at what it might be for or what it's doing in the middle of a temple. Welcome to the Holy Game Grid. Would you like to play? Lily agrees, hoping the prize might be a blood staff. We appear on what seems to be the lower half of a large chessboard. A booming voice echoes through the game grid. Do not stray from the path if you value your health. Spectators fill the dark galleries to hoot derisive jeers at us and wager against our success. Billy's excited, which makes Rosie excited too. Varless thinking, adjusting her glasses. And Lily? She can't wait to get the jeep working and to just get the hell out of needles. It's total guesswork. We move north, we move north again. A booming voice says, You have strayed from the sacred path. Stray again and pay the price. From each of the corners of the grid, fortified structures bearing tremendous laser turrets rise through the floor. We move north, then we move west. Beams shoot out from each of the corner turrets. A loud voice screams, Do not stray from the path. Everyone gets zapped. Lily decides everyone should just rush to the other side. Beams fire at every step, and when we reach the other side, a crowned robot powers up and asks, How many steps is the one true path? Everybody looks at Vorla, who's adjusting her glasses. Eight? Wrong. Try again. Everyone, including the mayor's wife and Ace, end up playing the Temple of Blood's holy game grid a lot. 29? Wrong. 31? Wrong. 30? A trap door opens in the floor and we fall through to a massive chamber consisting of a great body of bloody water surrounding an island in the center. We stand on a small wooden dock to the south. To the north of us, across the blood, lies the island. We can just barely make out a large structure on that island. We dive into the bloody water and find that inhaling murky moat scum isn't very fun. Oh, and the fish are biting today, too. Lily just had to ask how it could get any worse upstairs. Finally, we reach the other side. The sniper on the southeast side of the island has his eyes on us. One sniper at 51 feet. Varla rips a clip. Looking through the dark using infrared, a sniper cries out, My sight's on you, aimed at your head. One sniper at 41 feet. Farla rips another clip. Finally, we reach a large wooden gate. It's locked. Locked gates makes Lily's job difficult. Lily has to blow it with TNT. Boom! So much for that gate. Lily notices a pressure plate just inside the main gate. Everybody needs to jump across. We're spotted by a patrol. Three guards and two blood beasts at 14 feet. Lily snaps a shot at the last guard, spraying him into a fine red mist. Ball rockets for Billy and power packs for everyone. In the center of the room, Varla discovers an automatic laser turret currently inactive, which explains the pressure-sensitive plate by the gate. More howitzer shells to frustrate Billy. And another blood staff. Too easy. Lily decides to keep looking. There's still a heavy wooden door in the center of the complex. Billy kicks it in. The shattered remains of a door hang on loose hinges. As Lily expected from his surroundings, the demon priest is an utterly corrupt individual. A flowing blue robe covers his diseased body, and a foul smirk twists his face askew. He smiles, and teeth blacker than ebony glint in the half-light. Palsy-racked hands grasp the bloodstaff tightly and threaten her with it. You will not have it, he whispers harshly. You cannot take my life. That has to be the real blood staff. The fighting is fierce and the mayor's wife and ace fall unconscious. Lily delivers the final bullet that takes the blood priest's life. She now has what must be the real blood staff. Now to escape from the temple of blood. Swimming back to the dock and ascending a flight of stairs, we find something strange. Although Varla doesn't recognize it at first, the object before her is massive and sends a shiver up her spine. She wants to study it, so the squad splits up to explore both sides at the same time. From the other side, Lily yells that it's a missile, but the insides have been removed. In the middle of the missile, there's a bubbling pool. Acid baths generally aren't good for you. Of course, everyone gets burned. 
There's a man by a console. Please help me. I've been trying to figure out the launch code for months. If you know what it is, please tell me. Lily remembers seeing it written on the chair in the large altar room. Motokim. The man shouts, free at last, and runs out. He must have went through this strange electrical field. The field flows through us and drops us outside the Temple of Blood? That's convenient. We return to His Holiness at the Servants of the Mushroom Cloud Church. So you have returned. Where is the blood staff? Lily gives him the blood staff found on the blood priest at the Temple of Blood. Thank you so much for returning the blood staff. I hear that there is trouble in Las Vegas. To show you my appreciation, here are some items that may help you survive in Las Vegas. Assault rifles, a Kevlar suit for Lily, and an engine? How did he know? After resupply, Leroy's everybody, including the mayor's wife and Ace, returned to the garage with an engine for the Jeep. Sin City, screams Billy, dragging her sister into a silly dance with her and circles around the engine. What's in Lily's report so far? Christina's nice once you get to know her. Spam Shade isn't a very good detective. His Holiness lost a ruby ring and a blood staff that was being used to murder Needle's residents. The Temple of Blood's holy game grid is no fun. Hobo dogs are made out of, well, hobos. And moody cutie prostitutes charge 15 bucks per extra leg. <laughs>